Okay, what do we got here? Some <coughs> organizational things. Uh, first off, due to one of the vagaries of parenthood, uh, throughout this quarter, I'm going to have to be running out of here right after the class each time to pick up my daughter. So that's going to take a certain amount of mania towards the last few minutes. Okay, the, the questionnaire comes back with a variety of answers. Uh, why have you taken this course? Uh, to understand my roommates was one of the most common answers. To understand my parents, that was up there a whole lot. Uh, there was the very interesting, because I love Vinit and Sam, but I'm not going to tell you guys who wrote that. You'll have to find out for yourself, I suppose. Um, why have you taken this class? I haven't taken it yet. Is this a trick question? Um, <laughs> and then the ever cryptic answer, why have you taken this course? Sometimes. <laughs> okay. Let's see, I am, uh, why are, what's your relevant background? I am a human with behavior. I'm not sure where the with comes from. Um, I am human, comma, mostly. Um, I am the daughter of two crazy doctors. Uh, let's see, relevant background, business, which I think is very apropos to the other lecture. Uh, with game theory, then some people really wrestling with their limitations. Uh, what's your relevant background? I am moderately observant. Um, <laughs> and then there's the poignant, what's your relevant background? None whatsoever, really nothing. Okay, so someone, self-esteem issues. Okay, then the question, have you taken either the bio core or the hum bio core? No, thank God. It was one of the more common answers. Let's see, preferences for subjects for about the 400th year in a row in this class. Uh, Stanford students were more interested in lectures about depression and stress than about sex. So I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> let's see. In terms of subjects one is least interested in, uh, one answer was, I'll let you know in a week or so. So that's to be looked forward to. Also for about the 400th year in a row, uh, the lecture topic that had the most people who really, really wanted to hear about it amid lots of people who really didn't want to hear about it was the biology of religious belief. So that is going to be an interesting lecture near the end. Uh, okay, questionnaire. Also, as shown in every single study out there and as shown in this class for many years, uh, on the average, females are more likely to pick peace over justice. Males are more likely to pick justice over peace, so make of that what you will. Um, other than that, you guys were all gender-free in your answers, despite what's been shown in some studies. Okay, so back to the evolution of behavior. What have we gotten to from the other day? We have vanquished the ghost of Marlon Perkins. We've gotten rid of this whole notion that behavior evolved for the good of the species, for survival of the fittest, any of that stuff. We have recognized that behavior is sculpted by evolution exactly, or any physical traits, any physiological traits, with that huge wonking proviso of oh, assume that there's a heritable component to some behavior. That's going to be the main point of controversy for the rest of this class. Okay, so given that, we were able to apply the basic rules of Darwin, variability that's heritable, source of mutation, run the machine then, and rates of traits and populations are going to change over time. Then, armed with that insight, we went after our three big building blocks of thinking about all of this, individual selection, a chicken is an egg's way of making another egg, uh, the selfish gene, all of that, animals behaving to maximize the number of copies of their genes in the next generation. Foundational point two, kin selection, laying down your life for two brothers or eight cousins. Sometimes the best way to maximize the number of copies of your genes are to help relatives as a function of relatedness, the whole world of obsession and kinship. Finally, number three, the world of cooperation among animals that are not necessarily related, reciprocal altruism and our entire world of game theory. How do you go about most formally and most adaptively figuring out when to cooperate, when to defect, and how to watch out for people cheating against you? People, brine shrimps and other trees and such. Okay, so with those in hand, 
what we're now going to do is start to take those principles and look at some specific examples of behavior out in the real world and ones which if you have a certain intellectual framework, not the stuff we covered the other day, would seem totally bizarre and how could the natural world work this way and what we'll see is lots of this begins to make a great deal of sense instead in the context of what we've been covering. Okay, so we start off here. So you're out and you're studying some pro... Oh. Okay, you're studying some primate species that you know nothing about and nobody else knows any of that scenario again and here's what you see. You have identified the males, they identify the females with your well-trained binoculars, and what you see is the males are a whole lot more aggressive than the females are. So let's start off, let's call species A the one with lots and lots of male aggression, and we'll call species B the one with only moderate amounts of male aggression. Okay, so what we see here is males have high rates of aggression. Given that these are primates and what their social behavior is like, what you soon recognize is what most of the male-male aggression is about is reproductive access. Females who are sexually receptive going through estrus, males being aggressive with each other for access to estrus females. So we've got our two species here, one with lots of male aggression and one with essentially no male aggression. In which of the species do you think basically all males are going to have roughly the same reproductive success, roughly the same rate of mating, roughly the same number of copies of their genes, and in which species are like 5% of the males going to dominate 95% of the matings? Okay, in which one are you going to see all the males have roughly the same reproductive success, A or B? B, B. okay. So male reproductive variance, low here, high here, because... That's what these guys are fighting about. Okay, so next trait. In which of those species would you expect to see males spending a whole lot of time being paternal, taking care of infants, all of that, and in which species do males not only not care about the offspring, they don't even know whose they are, and they're not in it for that. Which of the species is going to have high degrees of male parental investment? Okay, so let's see. Lots of male parental investment. Okay, so you are a female. You're a female. What are you looking for? In one case, you are going to mate with a male who's beginning to have this profile, and one case with this profile. You are a female, and you are of species B. Nah, species A. Species A. What do you want to look for in a male? What's the most attractive thing you can have in a male when deciding who to mate with, given this profile? These are males who are highly aggressive. The ones who succeed in this sort of realm of competition have vast reproductive successes, and they're not going to do anything at all with your offspring. What are you going to get out of this guy? Good genes. Good genes. Yes. And sperm, and that's about it. You're not going to get anything good genes. What the female is looking for is evidence of good genes. Evidence of the male being healthy, the male being resistant to all sorts of infectious diseases, pathogens, the male being capable of wasting absurd amounts of body energy on ridiculous, asinine, big, flourishy things like big peacock tails and big antlers and all of that displays of, I am such a studly warthog or whatever it is, that I can afford to waste this much of my energy each day on this secondary sexual characteristic. You would expect to see flamboyant displays in this species of, by the part of males advertising what it is that you got. And as we'll see, when we come to the sexual behavior lectures, you're going to see all sorts of cases and species where the males are trying to do false advertising, where they are trying to display evidence of better genes than they actually have, and where females have to have gotten very good at detecting that sort of duplicity. Okay, so females, or they're getting out of this guy's genes, so you might as well get good genes, and you were looking for how to determine that. Meanwhile, over this end... What's females looking for? 
yeah, but you're, you're looking for a guy who's competent, who's actually going to be good at taking care of kids. So what do you want him to do if you happen to be a bird and you're that female? You would love to see a guy who could prove to you how good he is at feeding babies. He comes and courts you with a worm. He comes and displays his male parental skills. So you're looking for guys who are <laughs> good at... Uh, this nice, harsh economic term, male parental investment. Ones who are going to be competent fathers because they're going to be doing some of the parenting. Okay, pushing on now. Now we get into dark, made-for-TV movie terrain. So you're the female. You're the female, and you've given birth, and your child or childs are starting to develop. In which species are you more likely to bail out and abandon your kids? and go try to get pregnant again someplace else. In which case are you likely to commit female cuckoldry? B. B. How come? Because that schmuck's going to stay there taking care of the kids after you <laughs> bail out. So it's in species like these where you have high male parental investment, you see females are willing to abandon the offspring because the guy is still there taking care of them. Okay, so primates. Primates do not give birth to 47 little primate piglets at a time kind of thing. <coughs> Typical primate, one birth, one offspring at a time. In which of those species are you going to see twinning? Okay, who says A? Who says B? How come B? Yeah, you got a two-parent household. You've got two parents being willing to take care of the kids. In species like these, you see very high rates of female twinning. And in species like these, you never see it because you give birth to twins, and one of them is going to starve to death within a week or two because you're pulling it off all on your own. Okay, let's see. What else? Life expectancy. In one of these species, females and males live roughly the same length of time. And the other, there's a big disparity in lifespan. Which species is there going to be the big disparity? A, how come? Yeah, these jerk males are doing themselves in that way, or if they're not doing themselves in that way, they're doing themselves in with all this idiotic testosterone, which is bad for your cardiovascular system and your liver and all of that. What you see is in species where you've got this profile, there is a big difference in life expectancy between males and females. And in this species, you don't see that. Okay, so a female... Now we start talking about body size, and in these two species, what's the best way for a female, if she just spots some guy from way across the field there, to figure out, is this guy going to be a reasonable approximation of a good parent? Uh, what sort of body features is she looking for? What would she want to see? What would she not want to see? Okay, what things would be an immediate turnoff for a female bee looking for a male who's going to be doing a whole lot of that parental investment stuff? What's that? Fear. 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 Okay, but what else in terms of physical characteristics, though? She knows nothing about the guy. She just sees him from across the field, and what's the kind of guy she wants to steer far away from? Yeah. Okay, so you're looking for markers of health and competence, but what sort of body traits? What should the individual's body look like? What should it not look like? Not be too big. Not be too big. How come? I mean, if it's too big, that means it's just investing a lot of energy in that paint that's also... Yeah, you don't want one of these idiot guys with the antlers who's got, you know, the big strapping musculature. What are you looking for? You want to have males who do the best possible approximation of being competent parents, which is they look like females. They should have <laughs> everything short of being able to lactate. They should have tiny testes. They should have body sizes that are roughly the same as the females. In a species like this, you see high degrees of what would be called sexual dimorphism, 
the body sizes are very different. And exactly there, in the species like this, what you have is females, if they had their druthers, would like to be mating with other females. But since they're stuck with these males, they might as well at least select for guys who are not wasting energy on these idiotic secondary sexual characteristics and aggression and all of that, and instead have this pattern. So what have we done here? Simply by the principles laid out the other day, we now have seen exactly why it's the case that you could have stumbled into these two species and known these two animals and known this was an adult female, this was an adult male, and knowing nothing more about it, you can now tell a huge amount about what this species is. This is clearly a type A. And this is what would be called a tournament species. A tournament species characteristic are all of these traits going together. In contrast, this is what would be called a pair bonding species. Males and females stay together for life. And this is the classic picture. These are baboons. Baboons, the male body size about twice as big as the female. Notice these ridiculous secondary sexual characteristics in the form of these major canines. These are not guys who are using these canines to delicately carry their offspring off to, you know, <laughs> jamboree kind of thing. What you're having instead is this is being used for aggression. Huge difference in body size, and along goes all those traits, and suddenly, all you need is one of those lines there that you could spot. And using our principles from the other day, you know all about the personal sex lives of these animals, who's more likely to bail out, what you look for in a partner, all of that. So these are all sorts of species that show high degree of dimorphism, these tournament species, most of the old world primates. Baboons, rhesus monkeys, macaques, gorillas, chimps, all those guys. In the rest of the world, lions. Lions, Mufasa comes with his big sexually dimorphic mane and a much larger body size, and despite the wonderful heartwarming stuff, does squat for raising young Simba <laughs> there. And in all those other cases, you see the sexual dimorphism. Roosters and chickens, that's where you get pecking orders from, from male-male competition, male peacocks with their ridiculous secondary sexual characteristic peacockery, and that's a whole realm of species like that. Meanwhile, over at this end, in the primate world, these are all the South American monkeys, marmosets, tamarins, and we will post some pictures on the website, and when you will see, if you look at them, a pair of tamarins, a pair-bonded pair, together for life, and you can't tell which one's the male and which one's the female. They have the exact same body size. The male is not wasting energy on like some ridiculous neon flashing whatever above his testes. What you have instead is they're indistinguishable. And then you notice something very interesting, which is each one of them has a baby on their shoulder. All of the New World primates twin. All of them have low degrees of sexual dimorphism. All of them pair bond for something approximating life, except for the females when they occasionally abandon their offspring to go mate with someone else. You see the female cut. This whole packet, this is 600 bird species that show this pattern as well. These are swans when their mate dies that they just waste away amid operatic music and all of that. So you see these two extremes, and this is an extreme where you take one look at any of these traits in a species you've never seen before and see which box you can put that one in, and that has told you a huge, huge amount about the behavior, the physiology, the secret lives of the species, just building on the principles from the other day. Okay, so one domain here where we now have some insights. Next, another domain. So back to Marlon Perkins and Marlon Perkins and his view of the world and how animal behavior works. And what you see is an absolutely reliable rule, which is everybody loves babies. You take polar bears and you show them pictures of cute puppies and they go ooh and you take boa constrictors and you show them pictures of kittens or newborn hue and they their eyes dilate and everybody loves infants infants inhibit aggression that was the marlin perkins view infants are signalers of vulnerability and thus infants decrease aggression then 
in the 1970s, a researcher named Sarah Hurdy, who at the time was at Harvard, but since then has been at Davis, came back from years of study of Langer monkeys in India. And she came back reporting something very, very unsettling, which is, despite what Marlon Perkins said, every now and then, male Langer monkeys would kill all the infants in their social group. They would murder them. They would commit infanticide. And soon, word came back that you would see this in other species as well. Hamsters, gerbils, you would see this. Lions, mountain gorillas. Every now and then, a male would kill the infants in a group. Marlon Perkins, nothing in his universe could explain something as bizarre as this, as infantis, ooh, babies inhibit aggression, and here you have a whole bunch of species suddenly popping up where instead you see males killing babies. Now, the first obvious response from the Marlon Perkins crowd was something about these Langer monkeys, they're all on some toxic something or others they've been eating, their behaviors are abnormal. And some, but then word starts coming in from all these various species, and infanticide is popping up again and again. So when does that make sense? And it turns out there is a characteristic to all these species where you show male infanticide. What you've got is a breeding group with a bunch of females, typically siblings, typically cousins, that sort of thing, and there will be one breeding male in the population. What the people in the business refer to as a harem structure, even though that's a complete misnomer, but you've got one guy in there who's doing all the matings. Where are the other guys? They're all scattered in the hinterland and what are often called bachelor herds, things of that sort. And they're out there getting like zero reproductive success and mostly butting heads with each other to no end whatsoever and to no use whatsoever. And what they're doing is every now and then one of them manages to defeat the resident male of this group, manages to drive him out, and he then comes in and takes over. Now here's the critical point. You see infanticide when the average tenure of one of these resident males is shorter than the average interbirth interval in the species. What is that about? What's that about? What that means is you're one of these bachelor herd guys and you've been like pumping iron and stealing steroids all this time and you're finally in shape to come in and drive out this guy, drive out this guy who's been mating and father all these babies. And statistically, you're going to be defeated and booted out long before any of these females become pregnant again long before they nurse and wean their kids. Your average time that you are going to be this resident male is shorter than the typical length of time between births with females. So you, you've done all that work all those years to get into shape, to take over one of these, and you're going to be booted out and long forgotten before there's any passing on of genes. What's the logical thing to do at that point? Kill all the babies in the group. And that's where you see the competitive infanticide. In species where you have a single resident male, where the turnover rate is fairly quick so that males are unlikely to stick around long enough to have the present infants grow up, and what you see instead is the new males systematically kill the babies. And that accomplishes two things. The first thing it does is, by killing the infants, the females stop lactating. We will soon, down the line, see what hormonal changes occur there so that she starts ovulating again. The female comes back into estrus. What's the other advantage of killing the infants? You've decreased the reproductive success of the male who was there before you. And you see this pattern in lots and lots of species. And here is the greatest demonstration of how that Marlon Perkins you know, behaving for the good of the species, goes down the tubes. As I mentioned, you see competitive infanticide in mountain gorillas. Mountain gorillas are, like, the most wonderful species on Earth. They're totally amazing, and there's only, like, 700 of them left in the world, and they are gradually going extinct because of habitat degradation and poaching and warfare and human diseases coming in. And part of why they're also going extinct is because they do competitive infanticide. 
what is ideal for the individual selection, a chicken is an egg's way of another egg, passing on scenario for an individual animal there, sure as hell isn't functioning for the good of the species, it's driving the species towards extinction. This competitive infanticide is one of the clearest examples you can get of how selfish genes and genomes can be. Okay, you begin to see even subtler examples of it. So now you've got species where you've got the same pattern, resident male, he gets booted out, a new male comes in, and in some species, what you have are the females are pregnant at the time. So you're that male, and now what do you have to do? Not only do you have to like wait until the female gives birth, and then you kill the kids, what a drag, what a hassle that's going to be. What's a much more efficient strategy? Harass the female to the point of her miscarrying. And this is precisely what you see in a whole bunch of other species. Wild horses, for example, when you have a, is it a stallion or a mare? Or which, which is the, the male one? Stallion, yes, the stallion. The stallion named Mufasa or Rintintin or something, he comes in and goes through the same thing and boots out. And what happens then? Not only does he attack infants, he harasses the pregnant females to the point of miscarrying. By the time you get to things like hamsters, the whole thing is even more elegant. You are now a female, and now let's begin to look at it from the perspective of the female who wants to pass on lots of copies of her genes. So a new male comes in, you are pregnant, and what you know is he's going to start hassling you, or as we all learned when we had like baby gerbil pets or whatever, he's going to eat the babies once they're born, that sort of thing. And what do you do instead? Because you, the female, want to have your own evolutionary good luck going on there. Okay, if I give birth to these kids, they're just going to get eaten. What do you do? You spontaneously abort. If you are pregnant, when a new male comes in, the females spontaneously abort, something called the Bruce Parks effect. And what you see is it's the smell of a new male which causes this to occur. The females smell this novel male. Stress hormone levels go up high enough that that causes a spontaneous miscarriage. So that's great for the female. It's not great that she's losing this whole litter in the event, but at least she's not going through the cost of an entire pregnancy and then lose the kids. It is cutting your losses. Okay, there's one exception to this, though. Okay, so you have a resident male, and you're a hamster, and that whole world, and he's just gotten booted out, and in comes a new male. And in this case, even though you were smelling this new male and you were pregnant, you don't have the miscarriage. Who's that new male? <coughs> who just made a sound? The brother. Yes, the brother of the male who was booted out. Kin selection out the wazoo there. If it's a close relative of the resident male, the new male does not trigger this effect. And as we'll see by next week, what's the nuts and bolts of it? They smell really similarly because of a genetic signature that winds up in your odors. Okay, so all of this utter bizarrity of, oh my God, killing infants makes huge amounts of sense. Now, let's look at another strategy that females have to try to deal with this because they're not doing so well. Ooh, either their kid is killed or they've got to like spontaneously abort and waste all that energy on it. A very interesting strategy that the female langur monkeys have come up with. Okay, so you're a female in your group and the male has just gotten booted out and you have an infant, or you know that if you uh, have an infant soon, the male is going to be all aggressive and kill your kid, all of that, what do you want to do? We want him to decrease his aggression targeted at you and your offspring. What do you do? You go into something called a pseudoestrus. A pseudoestrus, a fake estrus. It's not a real one. Pregnant females at the time will go into a fake estrus, and this new male will mate with the female, and you know, two weeks later she gives birth, and the male is sitting there saying, wait a second, doesn't our species have a five-month gestation period? Two weeks since I got, whoa, what a guy, what a guy, look what I did there, all of that. And he gets faked into thinking it's his offspring offspring, when a new male comes in and the pregnant females mate with him when going through pseudoestrus, he doesn't attack the offspring. 
showing just the cognitive limits there of these males. Okay, <laughs> so another whole bizarre realm of behaviors here that makes sense only in the context of all those principles from the other day. Next domain, some milder version of this. Okay, you're watching baboons, and here's some big, strapping, terrifying male who's about to pounce on a lower-ranking guy and pummel him. And the lower-ranking guy, what does he do as this big guy is coming towards him? He grabs a baby. He grabs a baby and holds it conspicuously in front of him. And a lot of the time, this big male doesn't attack him. How come? Oh, because babies decrease aggression. Everybody loves babies. Babies makes everything less than you're doing infanticide. We just saw that explanation went out the window. You watch them long enough, and you see it's not random who the low-ranking guy grabs when he grabs an infant. Who is he grabbing? The likely child of that male, an infant born during the period following when this guy was high-ranking, what is now called kidnapping. And what's clear is, it's basically saying, I got your kid, you attack me, and your kid's going to get it. And this is a good deterrent. You see, it's non-random who was chosen. The infant is the most likely offspring, that kind of thing. Okay, so here's a circumstance. You see, here's a male, a high-ranking, terrifying male, who is raining terror down on top of all these guys, except he only joined the troop a week ago. And what you see is, when he's threatening other males, they don't do kidnapping against him because they know none of those individuals could be his kid. You don't see kidnapping against threatening males who have recently joined the troop. And one of the best ways, by the time you're looking at primates, I mean, we're going to be looking at all sorts of species where you just see it's all just machinery going on in there. By the time you're looking at primates, some of the best ways to see what's going on is when they make mistakes because they're calculating just as we are at times. And I saw one of these a number of years ago, and this was like some big high-ranking baboon who was coming down on a middle-ranking guy, an aging male, who was past this prime, who used to be high-ranking, and here he's about to get pummeled. And what does he do? He looks around, he looks around, and he grabs a kid and holds it. And you say, oh, no, that's probably his kid he just grabbed. In this last moment there, this was a kid who was born a number of years earlier. When this guy was high-ranking, he grabbed the wrong kid. And you're sitting there saying, oh, my God, all this theory is wrong, and I'm never going to get my degree, and these damn baboons don't make any sense. And here comes the big guy coming down while he's holding his kid, saying, hurt me and the kid. And he suddenly stops. And sort of, and at the last second, he tosses his kid clear of it. He just figured out he wasn't making any sense. So you see, in a case like that, once again, behaviors that are initially utterly puzzling fit perfectly into some of these models. Next example. Now you look at all sorts of other primate species, and mostly old world ones, macaque monkeys, those guys once again. And you look at male dominance, and what's male dominance about? It's who wins fights and who defeats who. And what one soon realizes is it's much more actually about social intelligence, who you piss off, who you don't, which coalitions you form. But then let's look at the females. Females spend their whole life in the same troop. And a female is essentially born with her rank, the rank that she's going to have her entire life. Who is one step higher in the hierarchy than this female? This is a female, and she's born, and from day one you could see she's number seven in the hierarchy. Who's one step above her? <laughs> yep, that's the answer. Seven comes after six. Okay, let me rephrase this, smarty pants. Who's number six? Who's number six? This female has been born with a rank. Yeah? her older sister. And who's number five? Okay, I see this is just going to keep going. Okay, we're running out of sisters. Who's number four? Her mother. Yes, females inherit their rank. A female's oldest daughter gets a rank one below her, her next daughter one below that. And you know your rank from your first year of life from your first week of life, if you're one of these folks, what we see here is, ooh, how to explain a system? 
This is nepotism. This is being born into a royal family or being born into a low-ranking lineage. This makes total sense from everything. This is kin selection writ large. Okay, so that makes wonderful sense. Nepotistic dominance hierarchies. Okay, so let's look at some more examples now. An issue out there. So, do you want to have a male or a female offspring? Do you want to have, back to our caveat of assuming volition when it isn't really there, what sort of sex ratios occur in different species? So you've got something, you've got a very interesting mechanism that goes on there, which is suppose instead of a 50-50 sex ratio, there's been some skew and there's a whole lot more females than males. You're now getting to decide, getting to decide what sort of offspring you want. There's a lot more females than males. Who do you want to give birth to? Okay, somebody, somebody left a hand. There's an excess of females. Do you want to give birth to a daughter or a son? Son, because that's the rarer commodity. There's an excess of males. Who do you want to give birth to? A female. Excess. What you see there is there is a self-regulatory thing that causes oscillation around a 50% sex ratio. Frequency-dependent selection. If females are in excess, males are what you want to have. If males are in excess, females are what you want to have. So this is a basic feature of lots of different species. Now superimpose something on top of it. You are a high-ranking female, and you know your offspring, even if you don't have a hereditary rank system for both types, you know whoever your offspring is is going to be big, and successful and healthy and all of that, your child is going to do extremely well by the competitive rules of their gender. Do you want to have a daughter or a son? How come? Yeah, because of this high male reproductive variant stuff. In species like that, if you have a kid who's going to do great, your investment, you want to gamble the big, grisky one on a male. On the other hand, if you are low ranking and you want something much more conservative, the logical thing is to have a daughter because the female reproductive success is much more evenly skewed. And what you see there is, in lots of species, that's precisely what you see. There is a bias among high ranking females towards giving birth to males. These are like 3% biases in the skew, so these are not major effects. But nonetheless, you see this sort of skew. And this has been documented. Okay, so now we throw in an extra little detail there. How do you do this? How do you pull off a mechanism for this? And this is now, instead of jumping from evolution all the way in our time chart, this is now like somewhere, what's the nuts and bolts of how the body does this? And there's a very simple answer. Males cost more as fetuses than females do. And that accounts for it. If you are a high-ranking female, your nutritional state will be better than a low-ranking female. Your male fetuses are more likely to come to term. And that seems to be the mechanism for it. What would be evidence to support that general picture? What you see in primates is during times of famine, the whole shift is towards more females in the population because you are having selective loss of those really expensive male fetuses. You get a skew in that direction. So this is seen in lots of cases. This is seen in some human examples. For example, this is studies we will hear over and over in this course about how wonderful the Scandinavians are, not, be, not only because they're like peaceful Scandinavians, but because they're also obsessive record keepers. And anytime you want to do a study about what humans have been up to for the last 400 years, go to Iceland, go to the Finns, go to something, because they keep incredible genealogical records. So over and over, we're going to hear studies that were done in multi-generational Scandinavian populations. So here's one of them. Okay, you are a woman. And what they show in these studies stretching back centuries is if you give birth to a boy, your next offspring on the average is going to have a lower body weight than if you give birth to a girl. It was expensive enough doing that male process thing that even one pregnancy later, you were still trying to recover from the trauma of it all. That pattern has been shown. What else do you see? 
the offspring, the next kid in line, has a shorter life expectancy if you had a boy than if you had a girl. The costs of being pregnant with a male are enough that it leaves an imprint, a lifelong imprint on your next offspring. Huge differences in cost. That's why you begin to get skews of sex ratios depending on ranks of animals. Another study. In humans, you see the exact same thing. Women with poor nutrition are more likely to give birth to girls. It skews in that direction. Women during periods of famines, you get a skew towards female offspring. What's the explanation? Human fetuses, males, are more expensive as well. So over and over, we see stuff that, wait a second, like what your rank is determines if you're more like or influences if you're more like I have a boy or a girl. And that makes sense. It makes perfect sense in the context of everything we've been hearing about here. Okay, more examples. Now we have something very puzzling that will soon not be puzzling. So you got Mufasa, actually enough of the Lion King stuff because it's going to get more and more strained here. Um, You've got Nemo. Okay, so you've got a pride of lions. You've got a whole bunch of females, and you've got the resident male lion, and that's how lions work, and he'll get booted out, and a new one comes in, competitive infanticide. We know the drill. Every now and then, though, you will see a pride with two males, polyandry. Polyandry, multiple males, as opposed to polygamy, multiple females, which the resident male lion, the pride lion, is polygamous with all this. Every now and then, you will see a pride instead where there's two males there, and thus polyandry. Who are the two males? Brothers. Brothers. Oh, you're not even... That's boring by now. Yes, brothers use this as a particular type of polyandry called Adelphic polyandry when it's two brothers who are doing the mating. When you see lion prides with two males, it is typically two male siblings. You see something similar in humans. Anybody know about the, uh, the marriage system in traditional Tibetan society? Yeah, is that a hum- totally humbio? Yeah. Who is it who said, thank God they hadn't taken the humbio core? Don't you wish you had now? In Tibet, <laughs> what you have is a pattern of Adelphic polyandry as well. A woman will marry her husband, and as part of the deal, she will also marry her husband's younger brother and much younger brother and the five younger brothers, and her husband's infant brother. And you will see these delightful pictures, inevitably in National Geographic, of here's some traditional Tibetan woman with her husbands, ranging from the big buff guy next to her down to the little infant there in the diapers. And these are all her husbands. They're all brothers. In this case, a very effective technique for dealing with inheritance of land rather than splitting up the land amongst all the different sons. This is a mechanism for maintaining it there. It's the same thing. When you see polyandry in Tibet, it's always Adelphic polyandry. So that brings up the issue of who you should want to marry. Now we've got two conflicting problems from the other day. The first one is we see the huge advantages of kin selection. Kin selection fosters much more cooperation, that sort of thing. By any logic, what you should want to have is as much inbreeding as possible because that will foster huge amounts of kin cooperation and that will be very successful. So organisms who marry their close relatives will leave more copies of their genes thanks to kin selection. So huge evolutionary pressure for inbreeding. What's the downside of inbreeding, though? We all know what the downside is, which is increased risk of congenital disorders coming through. So we've got two opposing things. One whole branch of evolutionary biology predicts advantages of inbreeding. Then a whole realm of medical genetics predicts the disadvantages of inbreeding. Where do they balance out? And a number of studies have now looked at various species, looking at the reproductive success as a function of the mating, the likelihood of the offspring surviving, and it turns out it's somewhere around third cousins that you get the optimal survivorship of offspring, the advantages of kin selection in breeding finally being offset by the disadvantages of the congenital disorders of inbreeding. So that's shown in all sorts of species. That's shown in humans. Back to those ever-handy Scandinavians, this was a recent paper. I think you guys have it in the reader. 
Um, and this is one showing, looking at centuries worth of records of agricultural populations there. Or maybe it was Iceland. I don't remember which one. Or maybe it was all of them. But what they were able to do there was look at how related the marriages were or weren't over the course of these centuries, how likely the offspring were to survive, and what comes back as the optimal mating in human populations there, marriages between third cousins. That's the most likely to increase reproductive success. Yuck, we all say. That is totally repulsive. You look at humans for 99% of hominid history, and what these hunter-gatherers were doing was spending their lives in small hunter-gatherer bands filled with relatives where they typically wind up having kids with a third cousin. That's the human norm over the course of history. That turns out to be the most optimal. Okay, so now as you can contemplate your third cousin, let's take a five-minute break and we will resume. Okay, even worse. Let's get going again. Great question just now. Okay, so people sitting around those those wonderful Finnish agriculturalists marrying their third cousins, had they all done the math and figured it out? This is back to that issue of how conscious are these strategies. Almost certainly they were not looking at 300 years worth of birth records and survival records. And as more evidence for that, you see that same third cousin deal in bird species. Finches, when you look at the optimal mating, it's third cousins there as well. And those guys certainly are not reading the textbooks about evolutionary biology. Again, that whole issue of volition. Okay, pushing on, some more examples, ones that are initially totally boggling but will soon make perfect sense. Here we have a pedigree. Here we have each individual had a mother and a father. I offer up for those new this. And what you see is you get half your genes from each. And one of the basic laws of Mendel, parentheses, if this doesn't seem like a basic law to you, good sign to go up to the catch-up sections. One of the basic deals is you get half your genes from one parent, half from the other. And in terms of their effects, it doesn't matter which one you get it from. Like if one of your parents, if your father carries some mutation and you inherit it, you're going to have the exact same disease profile as if your mother had the mutation and you inherit it from her. That's just a feature of how Mendelian genetics work. You get your genes, half from each parent, and in terms of how they work in you, it doesn't matter which parent you got it from. So that's how the whole universe works until people started noting an interesting realm of of exceptions to this. There would be a disease which people recognized was genetic. It was due to mutation. And they would look at the records of all the people who had this disease. And that's kind of bizarre. When you look at the patterns, they only inherited the disease from their fathers. Okay, there's all sorts of genetic disorders that are sex-linked. That makes perfect sense. Meanwhile, next door, there's a completely different disease, a genetic disorder, where the pattern is that you inherit it from your mother. That's fine also. Makes perfect sense. Finally, along come the molecular biologists who discover what the gene is and what the mutation is, and it's the same gene. That's impossible, according to Mendel. If you get this mutant gene from your father, you have a completely different disease than if you get the mutant gene from your mother. This violates everything about how this stuff works. And what you've entered now is this world that swept in about 20 years ago, world of what are called imprinted genes. Imprinted genes where their function differs depending on which parent you get it from. Utterly boggling, totally confusing, both at the level of how this actually works on a molecular level. For those of you who know terms like methylation, the genes are differentially methylated depending on who the parent was. The main thing is this was totally nutty and examples of imprinted genes and diseases of imprinted genes popping up. Nobody could make any sense of this. And then about 15 years ago, an evolutionary biologist at Harvard named David Haig came up with a possible explanation which generated all sorts of predictions if it was true, and he turned out to be absolutely right. So you look at imprinted genes. What sort of genes are they, and what are the functions of them depending on which parent you get it from? And he noticed something interesting, which was for imprinted genes, 
the genes that one is getting solely from one's father, you get it from your mother, but it's inactivated. It doesn't do anything. The genes you are getting from your father, all of those tend to push towards faster, larger fetal growth. The genes you get from your mother that are imprinted, what they all do is slow down the rate of fetal growth. Okay, let's look at this in where it's been best studied in hamsters. Hamsters, what do you got? You got that deal where it's a resident male and he gets booted out. The male you have mated with is going to be so gone by the time you give birth, the odds of you ever seeing this guy again, let alone mating with him again, is virtually zero. In other words, if you are a male hamster and you have mated with a female, the future reproductive success of this female is of zero relevance to you because you're going to be four valleys over by then. So if you had a choice at that point, if you could do something so that that female during her pregnancy with you, so that her offspring were going to be more likely to survive and be healthier... But the trade-off was she's not going to be as fertile down the line because of the cost of this pregnancy. What do you care? You're out of there. You could care less. In fact, that's a good thing because some other guy is going to be having the next pregnancy with her, and that decreases his reproductive success. What you see is in species where males just show up, mate, and are never heard from again, the imprinted genes from the males push for faster fetal growth bigger fetuses who take up more calories from the circulation, I want my kids to do great. And in those species, the imprinted genes from the female slow down fetal growth. And you can see wild examples of this when there are mutations in those, when they're knocked out of action, and you see the effect of one from one of the parents without the counteracting effect from the other. For example, there's one class of imprinted gene disorders in humans where when you've got the male uh, gene that's contributed to this pairing, if there's a mutation and it's knocked out, what you have then is the female slowing down the fetal growth gene predominates. What's the disorder there? Fertilized eggs don't implant. The uterus doesn't develop. Meanwhile, if instead it's the female gene that's the source of the mutation, so now you've got the male fetus grows faster effect without any counteracting, what's the disease profile there? One of the all-time bad cancers to have something called a choriocarcinoma, stuff is growing so fast in that chorionic tissue that you get this wildly aggressive cancer showing the push and pull in the opposite directions. So what does this begin to imply there is a war going on between the male and the female in terms of how much should the female invest in this pregnancy versus ones down the line, how much does this male care about the future fertility of this female versus for the present, and when you see the cases where this is a species where the males tend to move on, you see lots of these imprinted genes. And it was soon the case that they actually began to identify some of these genes, and they made perfect sense. For example, in humans, one of the male imprinted genes is for something called insulin-like growth factor. What does insulin-like growth factor do? It stimulates fetal growth, and it's one of those pushing the fetus to grow faster. What's the female imprinted gene that counters it? It's the receptor for insulin-like growth factor, and the female-derived one doesn't work very well. In other words, it's trying to blunt the signal from the male. What you have is this arms race, this co-evolutionary war between the two genders. There are other male imprinted genes that push the female towards dumping more glucose into the bloodstream for the fetus. What's the downside for her? What's that causing? Gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is driven by male imprinted genes that push for more glucose being dumped. In. It's this war going back and forth. Then people discovered imprinted genes that were only being expressed in the brain. And what was that about? It turned out to be the exact same war. These were affecting behavior of the kids after they were born. Some of these male imprinted genes expressed in the brain made these kids more robust, assertive nursers. In other words, they were pulling more calories out of mom, increasing their likelihood of survival at the cost of mom's future health. 
where you see those playing off. So this is totally cool, fascinating stuff, which made no sense at all until viewing that males and females do not have necessarily shared genetic interests in terms of leaving copies of genes in species like these. There's this co-evolutionary war going on. Now, at this point, you should be kind of wondering, okay, so you see these imprinted genes in folks like these, species where the male is migratory, he shows up, he mates, he's never heard from again, he's got zero investment in the future reproductive success of his female. In contrast, in pair bonding species, the male is in it for the long run. You don't see imprinted genes in the pair bonding species. So you'll note before... I mentioned when people were first beginning to understand these, these were not medical geneticists dealing with the tragic genetic disorders of like lizards. They were dealing with genetic disorders in humans, humans who have all sorts of imprinted gene diseases. What does that say about our status as a pair bonding species? It makes it look a little bit squishy there. And this is the first pass of the theme we're going to come through here. Humans have, for example, imprinted genes, not as many as you find in typical nomadic male polygamous systems, but more than you find in pair-bonded species. Humans are sexually dimorphic. On the average, males are bigger, heavier. They have longer canines. They've got all sorts of other stuff. They're sexually dimorphic, more so than in pair-bonded species, less so than in typical tournament species. Humans have differences in life expectancy, but over and over by these measures, what you see is we're somewhere in between. We are one incredibly confused species when it comes to are we pair bonders or are we polygamous? And what that obviously explains is like 90% of literature and movies out there, the fact that humans are kind of somewhere in between. And when we get to the sexual behavior lectures, what we're going to see is a perfect example of that. The majority of cultures in the history of this planet are polygamous. Okay? So it sounds like we're getting pushed in this direction. When you look at those cultures, the majority of men, however, are not polygamous. Polygamy is what you see among the wealthy men. Ooh, pushing back in this direction. And then there's human societies that obviously have lots of pair bonding and have all their cultural attributes but pushing in that direction. And when you look closely, human pair bonded societies are often about social pair bonding, not sexual pair bonding. Lots of extra pair matings going on. So what you see is, from the standpoint of even a cultural perspective, we are all confused and waffling around the middle there. We will look much more at this. But the first bit of evidence here is humans have some of these imprinted gene diseases showing an intersexual warfare over the cost of reproduction, but we don't have as many as in the classic other species. Another example of this. Then you see there's all sorts of fruit fly species where what the male is doing is something very similar. What you've got there are females who mate with multiple males and thus get sperm from multiple males. And what males come with are sperm that are not specialized in fertilizing the egg. What these sperm do is they poison the sperm from other males. They come with spermicides or some such thing, whatever they might be called, you see sperm-sperm competition going on in a lumber of spy, spy fleeces, fly species, where uh, the female mates with multiple males. Okay, so the males are going about their warfare. Does this have a downside for the female? Yeah, because she's sitting there swimming in all these toxins that the male's sperm have released inside them. It causes damage to the reproductive tract in females after a while. What you see is in fly species where this goes on, females secrete antitoxins in their reproductive system, this same coevolutionary war going on. Okay, one other example to make sense of sort of our principles we've got by now. So back to baboons. Back to baboons, and what you see there is males hit puberty, and they leave their home troop, and they join their adult troop. Females spend their entire life in the same troop. They've inherited their rank from mom, nepotistic dominance hierarchies. So all the adult males in that troop have grown up elsewhere. Meanwhile, in chimps, It's the females who leave at puberty and the males who spend their whole life in the same troop or the same group there. 
So we've got baboons with one system, chimps with the opposite. Okay, just to get started here, so in which species are females on the average in a group going to have higher degree of relatedness to each other? They're more likely to be related. Baboons, yeah, because the females don't leave. The females stay there, the males stay there. Okay, so in which species are the males more likely to be related? That's the profile of the chimp. In which species are males more li- in a group more likely to kill each other? Baboons. Now the critical thing, in which species are males more likely to kill the neighbors? Chimps. And what you see is, on, among chimps, you see the invention of proto-warfare and genocide. And what chimps do, the male chimps of a group, is they will go out and have border patrols, the territories, and Jane Goodall first described this, and if they encounter a male from another group, they will attack and kill him. And what she documented in a number of cases, other people since then, is where males in a group will systematically kill all the males in the neighboring group. What is this? This is, for one thing, organized aggression, proto-warfare. There's all sorts of ritualistic stuff that the male chimps do beforehand to get themselves in this emotional contagion frenzy. To do this, what is this also? This is the building blocks of genocide. This is individuals being killed, not for who they are, but simply because of what group they belong to. Chimps do this. Baboons don't do this because they're way too busy trying to kill each other within a troop. What you see is in groups where there is female exogamy, when females are the ones who leave at puberty, you are left with this really, really, really scary situation, which is a whole bunch of males who are getting along well with each other. Because when that happens, that's when they start thinking about taking over the next valley. Thus a term we will come back to, or a soundbite, but we'll come back to in the aggression lectures, Often, the way to decrease homicide is to invent genocide. You see inverse levels, decreased aggression within a group is often occurring because of organized aggression going outward. When males are the ones who leave at puberty, they're trying to kill each other within the troop. When it's the females who leave, you've got bands of brothers. And what we will see is the whole role of kinship and pseudo-kinship and aggression somewhere down the line. Okay, so this has been a grand tour of all sorts of oddities of animal behavior, including humans, which are utterly odd until we apply some of these principles, and we see here playing out individual selection themes, kin selection, all of that. Now, back to something which we trashed two days ago as just laughably obsolete and over the carcass of Marlon Burke, group selection. Animals behave for the good of the species. Totally trashed, gotten rid of, gone by the mid-60s for people who thought seriously about the subject. Animals behave for the good of their genes or for the reciprocity, all of that. Meanwhile, out in the wilderness for the last 20 years, there's been an evolutionary biologist named David Sloan Wilson, who's showing just how much he's been sort of a lunatic fringe voice, has spent his career at the State University of New York in Binghamton, which I have to tell you is not one of the places where you want to spend an academic career. He's been out in the middle of nowhere, and the reason why is for years and years, he's been saying, actually, there is group selection. Actually, group selection is part of this whole picture. For years, he's been pushing the notion that, yeah, 1960s group selection, animals behave for the good of the species is nonsense, but there is a version of group selection that does actually go on. And what has become clear is he is absolutely right. Okay, back to the discredited version of group selection. Animals behave for the good of the species. I give myself up for you, my offspring. I leap into the river, killed by the crocs. That sort of thing you don't see. What is the level of group selection where you begin to see that this, in fact, is a valid phenomenon? Okay, so here you've got a population and something or other happens, some geographical something, a land bridge comes up or a valley pops up one day or a mountain range or who knows what, and you get a subset of the population that gets isolated from the others. What you have now in this smaller population after a while is exactly what you get in small isolated populations, lots of inbreeding. Now have a relatively inbred population here. 
So what are they going to be doing lots of? Whatever advantages you get from kin selection, because they're going to be just steaming along there on their high degree of relatedness. In other words, what you see in populations like these is you're more likely to get spontaneous systems of cooperation and reciprocity because it's not driven by part three the other day, reciprocal altruism. It's being driven by part two, the kin selection. So you have here what is called a founder population, and it's inbred, and you will often see high degrees of cooperation there. Then something happens, the mountain range disappears overnight, who knows what, and suddenly these guys join the old population. And what you have is this previous founder group, group within the larger group, and you suddenly have precisely a group selection circumstance. The fact that these guys are, co- are cooperators with each other, they begin to outcompete the rest of these guys. Group selection on this level, this is absolutely what you see. And the cooperation at that point has to crystallize outward or else all these guys are driven into extinction. And that's what you see with founder populations. As we will get to in the aggression lectures, founder populations are a nice, interesting explanation for how you jumpstart cooperation in the first place. It gets started by way of kin selection, sneaks in the back door, and turns into reciprocal altruism. Okay, so here we see a case of selection on the level of groups. And so Wilson, this David Sloan Wilson, has this notion of group selection on an additional level as well. Okay, here you have a study he actually did. You have a bunch of chickens. And... Naturally, some chickens are meaner than other chickens. So you've got some of the chickens that are mean and others are not. And what you show is the mean chickens harass the unmean ones like crazy and tend to like decrease their fertility and they break their eggs and stuff like that. So within this group, mean chickens dominate unmean ones. Mean chickens have higher reproductive success than unmean ones. Now, instead, take a group of only mean chickens and a group of only wonderful kumbaya chickens. And what do you see there? These guys are all going about their reproduction. These guys are all killing each other's eggs and destroying each other's eggs. What Sloan Wilson showed was within a group, non-cooperators drive cooperators into extinction. Between groups, Groups of cooperators drive groups of non-cooperators into extinction. And that's sort of the critical notion of the way group selection has snuck in the back door again. It's when you have selection on the level of groups, traits that are disadvantageous within a group can be wildly advantageous when it's all of you in your group versus another one. That's the way group selection has come back in. And what you see is a case where an altruist could be much less fit than a cheater, but a group of altruists will defeat a group of cheaters every time. The term that's always used, the soundbite there is, they may lose the battles, but they will win the war. So group selection has snuck in that back way. Major, major sort of peace in our time thing occurred a couple of years ago. David Sloan Wilson group selectionist. Meanwhile, across the county over at Harvard is Edward O. Wilson. E.O. Wilson, they are not related as far as anyone knows. E.O. Wilson, who's the person who single-handedly sort of brought thinking about evolution as pertinent to biology. Major, major figure in terms of thinking about the evolution of behavior. E.O. Wilson, totally amazing guy who from day one hated group selection because that was boring, that was outdated, that had been trashed in the 60s. You could explain the whole world with individual selection, kin selection, reciprocal altruism, group selection, totally wrong. Meanwhile, there's David Sloan Wilson saying it really does exist in some circumstances, and it was like this pitiful match of like, this time Goliath just stomps David to dust there. E.O. Wilson at Harvard completely dominating the field. Poor David Sloan Wilson with his idiotic view of multi-level selection that includes group selection, totally clear who won. Then, about five years ago, E.O. Wilson, around age 80 or so, said, you know what? I've been wrong all this time. 
There are circumstances where you can have group selection. The other guy's been absolutely right, and since then they've been writing a number of super influential papers showing exactly where group selection comes in. Hooray for David Sloan Wilson. This is so impressive. Most 80-year-olds, all they want to do is every single fact they've ever heard in their life has to be true and can never be challenged again. Here's E.O. Wilson saying, no, actually, I was totally wrong on this. Group selection does occur at exactly the level this other guy has been pushing. Very, very cool thing. Okay, so in some cases, being age 80 can work out okay. More examples of group selection. Here's a cool example. Elephants, groups of elephants within a group of elephants, a herd. A herd? Have you heard of pachyderms? Okay, within a group of elephants, what has been shown is the older, the oldest matriarch is the better the infant survival rate in that group. Okay, what's the deal with that? Okay, the older, the oldest female patriarch, matriarch is, the better... Okay, obviously she's this wise old elephant who's helping her grandkids to survive. No, it's independent of relatedness. Independent of kin selection, having a very old female in a group makes it more likely that the kids will survive. How come? Because she knows what to do. She remembers 50 years ago when there was a drought like this where the trees were still fruiting in the valley four miles over that way. She has this aged matriarchal elephant wisdom, and what you see is this plays out at group selection. On the group level, groups with older matriarchs outcompete groups with younger matriarchs. This is classic group selection in a way that can't be explained by individual or kin selection or any of that stuff. So lots and lots of examples. Here's, if you think about it, one fascinating example of human group selection, one that had been avoided for thousands of years and suddenly appeared somewhere around 60 years ago. So we've got our cliched scenario in World War II and we've got the American troops fighting the Nazis in Europe, and because this was an inspirational movie made about it, who are the troops, the American troops there? You've got Kowalski, the Polish guy from Chicago, and Lopinto, the Italian guy from Boston, and Schwartz from New York, and who from the farms. You've got your central casting diverse array of Americans there fighting the Germans and for American freedom, and you suddenly realize something astonishing which is amid the American troops, there's Schultz. There's Schultz who grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, or whatever, three generations after his ancestors migrated from Germany. In other words, the degree of relatedness among the American troops fighting on the same side was lower than the degree of relatedness between these enemies. This is absolutely unprecedented. This is a totally new way of groups functioning. What human group selection is about are cultural means of making people seem more related than they actually are. We will come back to that theme lots later. Okay, so now we have this whole massive way of thinking about the evolution of behavior, our three major principles. Group selection is snuck in the back door. So, What are the things about this whole approach that people absolutely hate and just criticize like crazy and use to rip apart the very structure we have come to know and love in the last two days? What are the problems with this whole approach? The first one is one that next week is going to be all about. Okay, so we've seen here using these models the evolution of levels of aggression, the evolution of degree of male parental care, the evolution of what females find to be hot in males of their species, the evolution of genes. Oh, evolution is about genes. Evolution is not about degrees of aggression or cuckoldry or bodies. Evolution is what works on genes. And at some point, an entire field of people look at this and say, give me a break with your stories here. Show me the genes. And that's what you get from molecular biologists thinking about behavior. It's at that point that they look at this and say, this is all total nonsense because I'm not going to believe a word of it until you show me the genes. Show me the gene for deciding that you think that males who could bring you worms are hot. 
show me the gene for t deciding that infants are cute and you want to take care of them if you happen to be a male. Show me the genes. So that's the first massive criticism in this field, which is it's just making up stories. What do we have here? We've got a mud fight between two different disciplines, two different buckets. One bucket's version of an answer is the starting point for another discipline's bucket of this is exactly where our ignorance begins. So that's one critique. Here's another critique, and this is not one from another discipline. This is within the realm of evolutionary biology. Okay, so what this is about is endlessly tales about adaptation traits that make you more adaptive. The giraffe whose neck is 11D feet high is a little bit less adaptive than the giraffe whose neck is 11D.2 feet high. Every little bit of difference increases your fitness, your adaptiveness. Every single way in which you better match this model and do it perfectly and know exactly the prisoner's dilemma strategy is going to increase your fitness. In other words, what evolutionary fitness and evolutionary change is about is gradual small changes. That's the sort of intellectual concept behind everything we've been hearing about here, that change, evolutionary change, occurs in tiny steps over time. And this is what would be called an adaptationist picture of how this all works. Evolutionary change is in tiny incremental steps where every extra little bit of fitness is going to pay off. Every little bit counts. What are some of the consequences of that? For one thing, if every little bit counts, it means every little story you can make up as to why it's better to have this trait than that trait must wind up being relevant in some way or other here. So this is this classic gradualist school of evolutionary change where every smidgen of change is adaptive. Then, about 20 years ago, out at Harvard, a different group, one mostly led by Stephen Jay Gould, came up with a completely different view about how evolutionary change would occur. And what they said was it worked completely differently. It works completely differently in that gradualism is wrong. When you look at the fossil records, what you see are long, long periods where nothing changes whatsoever. There is no moderate little gradualist evolutionary change. Then there's some massive period of change, and then long periods of stasis, massive change. And what you see here is a totally different pattern. And this they termed punctuated equilibrium. Periods of equilibrium of stasis punctuated by periods of massive change. What's the implication of that? The implication is all throughout most of this time, there's nothing happening. There's no evolutionary change occurring. It doesn't matter if you're 2.3% better at timing your cuckoldry. All of, it makes no difference. The vast majority of the time, things are static. The vast majority of the time, all these little gradualist adaptationist stories are completely irrelevant to how things work. And the way the punctuated equilibrium people would make fun of these sort of people, they would say that what they do for a living is they come up with just so stories. Just why did the zebra get its stripes? Why did the female tamarind monkey bail out on her male and go mate with somebody else. Well, obviously by doing this, she's going to increase her reproductive success a thousandth of one percent and do that over enough time. That's going to lead, And their stand is, all you're doing is making up stories. What most of evolutionary change is about is occurring during very short periods. So this produced a massive major war between the gradualists and the punctuated equilibrium people. Why is this war interesting? Because it's basically an issue of whether all this minor little stuff we've been working out for the last two days makes any difference whatsoever. In the punctuated view, what you have is nothing's happening for a long period, and then some disaster occurs where whatever it is that's going on, it kills 99% of the population. 1% with some weirdo trait survive because of that trait, produces a very different profile, and then nothing occurs until you get another of what are called evolutionary bottlenecks. And in that view, 
doesn't matter if you've got 2% more adaptation in 11 D different behavioral traits. What's going to happen is the comet hits, and if you have whatever trait that allows you to be in the 1% that survives the comet or the 1% of the global warming or the who knows what, you get through, and the rest of the time, all of that stuff is nonsense. It's just so stories. Okay, so looking at these two patterns and the scientists who pushed for them, E.O. Wilson, the other people of this discipline, Stephen Jay Gould and his group, which of those two groups of scientists are more likely to be Marxists? The gradualists or the punctuated equilibrium people? Yeah, how come? Sudden change and dialectical something or other, and that's the last time I'm going to say that because I have no idea what I just said. But yes, the leftist view of long periods of stasis and gradual change and revolution. Revolution, not evolution. And something that caused this to be an incredibly contentious issue when this blew up in the 70s was it just happened by chance or maybe not by chance at all, that all of these early sociobiologists working out all these principles were all southern white males. That's kind of interesting. E.O. Wilson from Alabama, Trivers, all these other people. And it just so happened that all of these punctuated equilibrium people were leftist Marxist New York Jews. Oh, So we got two rather opposing worldviews, and what was obvious from day one with these two different branches was this argument is imbued with sociopolitical implications. And the stances, of course, were, well, in this world where every bit of competition matters and every advantage pays off, isn't that interesting in a competitive world like that? It produces, these guys would say, exactly the sort of world that these dead white male southerners benefit from, And the contrasting view would be these people's views just as imbued with political stances. This was a period where being an evolutionary biologist meant you had to have a very, very firm belief about Marx. Very contentious period in terms of making sense of this. Now, what the punctuated equilibrium people would say is an awful lot of time the little things that are changing that are of no significance whatsoever that mean nothing at all they're not relevant evolutionarily and Gould came up with a term to describe these he said they're evolutionary spandrels Spandrel, that was a word that at the time only existed in like art history or architecture which Gould brought into this room a spandrel is apparently like, I don't know, in some Gothic cathedrals where you've got these arches. By definition, because you have arches, you've got a space in between. And there'd be endless decorations, just like those, put up by painters and sculptors, whatever, over the years, that spandrels, the space between columns, would be highly decorative in all sorts of these Gothic churches. So spandrels... What are spandrels for? Do spandrels keep the building from collapsing? Absolutely not, because you could actually cut out this part. Spandrels were not selected for in the evolutionary process of making Gothic churches. They're just a byproduct of how you construct these things. You get a space in between. Spandrels don't mean anything. And what Gould and crew said was an awful lot of what these people think is meaningful are instead evolutionary spandrels things that just happen that have no significance to the nature of evolution. Here's the snotty example they would always give. Humans, among all the primates, are the only species with chins. If you think about that, we're the only ones who have chins. Some people's chins are less discernible than others, but nonetheless, humans have chins and other primates don't. And thus, if you are an adaptationist, gradualist, all of that, you have to ask a critical question. Well, what's the evolutionary advantage of having a chin? And soon the literature was rife with people saying, well, you know, if you have a pointy chin, you can like, get M&Ms out from the corner on the floor there, or you can use it to stab your opponents when you're trying to like, increase your reproductive success and all of that. Oh, there must be an adaptive advantage to humans having chins because every little bit of difference must... And humans have chins because if you happen to have a face that's like 
like this way instead of a muzzle and a jaw at this angle if you're going to have a human skull instead of a prime, non-human primate one. In the process of getting rid of the muzzle, you're going to get a little angle there and out pops a chin. In other words, a chin is a spandrel. And that was the heavy critique. All of this stuff we spent the last two days on, most of it means nothing because this is how evolutionary change occurs. It's all spandrels. It's all spandrels and people getting tenure because they make up the better just-so stories than the people who don't get tenure. That's how their field works. So what's been the evidence for gradualism, the evidence for punctuated equilibrium? And here the fights became very, very clear. Okay, what's this sort of evidence about? Pointing out in the fossil records, long, long stretches of time where some fossil lineage doesn't change at all, and then really rapidly there's a change, and then it goes on statically like that. Gould was a paleontologist. That was his training, and he had done vast amounts of work looking at the evolution of, like, snail shells or something, and where it showed this pattern. Okay, So paleontological evidence, geological evidence for punctuated equilibrium. Why do these guys rip that to shreds in two seconds saying evolutionary change? Are you out of your mind this in a flash here? This was 100,000 years. Give me a break. Here's another 100,000 years. That's plenty of time for all this stuff to be going on. Oh, the paleontologists have a totally different notion of what counts as revolutionary change than other people living, studying living systems. So that was one of the critiques. If you study actual living systems, you see gradualism. If you just look at fossil records of, you're more likely to see punctuated equilibrium. What was the next criticism? Okay, so what was Gould studying here that prompted this whole stance? He was measuring the angle of something or other on snail shells. What was this guy studying? The physical traces left by snail shells. What are we mostly interested in here? Neurons and hormones and physiological stuff that don't leave fossils. If you look at the fossil record, you look at the evolution of only the boring stuff the morphometry, the shape, the anatomy, all of that, and all of the stuff that we're interested in when we talk about the evolution of behavior, none of that leaves fossils. A brain that can discern the smell of a third cousin versus a second cousin, you're not going to be able to see that in the fossil records. By definition, these people would say, these guys, by studying the most boring aspects of evolution, are going to see stasis when the good stuff, the really interesting stuff, is instead having the gradualism. So that was the basic fight that went on, and this is one that has totally dominated the field since then. What we will see as we transition to our next topic now, the molecular biology of how behavior evolves, what we're going to see is coming in once again through the back door, a huge, huge vote of support for one of these two models. By the time the molecular people came in, they came in initially saying, genes, genes for this, genes for that, genes, give me a break, show me the genes, show me the DNA sequence, show me the protein that it codes for and how the protein works. That now shifts us to a completely different bucket, and what that bucket happened to do along the way was give a huge vote of support for one of these. So obviously now, since you cannot bear the notion of waiting until Monday to find out what molecular biology has to say about this, it's time to end. Okay, so I'll see you guys on Monday. Oh, by the way, you may have noticed on the coursework, there's very extended notes for each lecture that I've written up. What I'm going to do, say the evolution ones, were posted a few days ago, when I discover after the lecture that I totally screwed up explaining something or completely jumped over something, I will go and fix it in the extended notes and I will indicate there, this is something I forgot to say in lecture or this is actually what I meant to say in lecture. What's in the extended notes counts as the real thing. Oh, okay, another announcement, quick. The evolution catch-up sections are Monday, 7 p.m. in this room, and no doubt that will be posted also.